Well, as I heard some of the uh, panelists in our prior panels talk about uh, economics and uh, even then the definition of sustainability and being a sustainable operation is, is, a, is it financially sustainable and, and what things should you consider if you're looking at expanding an operation and what are the financial ramifications, uh, positive, negative from that. And so it's a great time to have uh, the three of you up here to, to help uh, continue on to those conversations and, and fill in the blanks. So. Um, first, I uh, want to introduce them. Uh, closest to me, uh, Terry Feldheim, the Regional Vice President with Farm Credit Services of America. He's uh, been with uh, Farm Credit Services for 38 years. Um, throughout his career, he served in the Northeast South Dakota as a financial officer, a real estate appraiser, and for the past seven years as regional leader for the Northeast uh, South Dakota team. Born and raised on a farm in North Central South Dakota, still has family members farming and ranching in that area. So. Um, welcome, Terry. And uh, maybe uh, just to have you uh, kick things off here a little bit, uh, you know, uh, what questions uh, should uh, should somebody be asking from a financial perspective or from, from your perspective? Uh, should they be asking themselves? Should they be asking others uh, when they're looking at uh, developing a livestock operation or expanding a, a family operation, either expanding livestock or getting into livestock? What are the things they need to be thinking about and what are those questions they should be asking folks? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike, and thank you, East River, uh, for the invite. It's an honor to be here, and livestock development is critical as to what we're doing and trying to accomplish in our state. To answer the question, I try to <clears throat> break that down in a couple different categories. From a management perspective and from a financial perspective, if you're going to come to the lender, they're going to want to know those things that you're, you're thinking about. Uh, I think about man management perspective, you answer the why you're doing this, why am I expanding and what's my goal here, but you think about, oh, there's a whole host of things from labor to nutritionists to vet to construction management piece of the puzzle. If you're going to do a project that requires that, do you get construction managers involved, cost containment, avoid cost overruns, things that you come up against, who in are you using for your marketing uh, plan uh, based on what uh, product, what protein sector you're in? I think about your risk management piece of that puzzle. I think about your business models. Are you working with yourself or different business models that are out there in which you need to address and understand the risk and the benefit of both uh, of, or any of those business models you come in and, uh, and are dealing with? Um, we talk about a business plan right up front. Um, uh, you got to have a plan because some of these projects get very, very large uh, and so forth. There's a whole host of other things you can think about. Then my mind goes to the financial side of that puzzle. Um, am I going to a lender that understands what I'm trying to do? You better be because there's a whole host of ways in financial structure and asset, uh, assets that you're going to be dealing with. From your, from your livestock to your facilities to your equipment, it goes on down the line. And how is that structured? I, I believe you really got to ask yourselves that question. Um, are there expertise, experts in their area? If they are not, where can you go to get that? That's critical when you think of it's dairy, it's swine, it's chickens, it's beef feedlots. Every one of those areas, it's very, very critical that they understand what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I talk a little bit about best fits. Is it a loan product? Is it a lease product? What are the advantages of both? So I think about the financial ramifications of each. Both have positives. Both have things that you might want to think, I better take a double, I better take another look at that. So what are those products that you can use? And then I ask the lender, what are your standards? What am I going to have to deal with, what are going to be your conditions, Mr. Lender, uh, how does that tie into my operation, what type of conditions am I going to have to have, am I going to have to have a certain set of records, am I going to have to have uh, you know, certain things involved with that, because it can get very, very involved, which can really make a difference as to how far you take that. And uh, you know, you get into the normal things of interest rates and things of that nature. Um, I always think about that should be one of the last things to talk about, and people say, no, it's very, very important. It is, but you better understand these other pieces, and you'll get the best rate that that lender has if you come to the table with some of those things, so. 
Very good. Well, our next uh, panelist uh, sitting in the middle is Ed Fegan. He's a senior agribusiness banker uh, and department manager with First Bank and Trust. Uh, Ed just joined First Bank and Trust in 2018. It uh, brought along with him over three decades of agriculture and commercial lending experience. In his current role, Ed plans, supervises, and directs the loan at the Ag Loan Department for First Bank and Trust. Ed serves his community with past and present leadership roles in the SDSU Alumni Association, Junior Achievement, and Farmhouse Fraternity Board of Directors. So, welcome, Ed. And uh, you know, in addition to that, uh, uh, the uh, the comments that uh, Terry made so far, um, how how can producers tap into the economic activity that uh, livestock uh, production livestock generates? How do? You well, I think one thing was talked about quite a bit here is is um, you know I think. One of the most important thing when you go to uh, bring a, a livestock expansion plan to the table is you're, you actually got to be a pretty good salesman to a lot of people. You know, I think, to obviously, sell the project to us. And I think you also back up, you got to, just like was talked about the session before us, you got to sell it to your neighbors. You know, I think uh, whenever I hear about uh, livestock projects, I always uh, bring up the initials NMBY. And I think you probably all know what them stand for, not in my backyard. You know, so you got that you gotta sell this project to your neighbors. You gotta sell it to the zoning, to the county commission, and so forth. But so you gotta sell it to a lender. You know, there's a, you know, you're nutritious, you're a veterinarian and so forth. So you gotta be a salesman for it, obviously believe in it, be informed of it. You know, Terry brought up the idea of the business plan, very crucial. Um, and then I think the other thing to ask yourself too is uh, you know what what uh, what obstacles are you going to encounter? Cost overruns, you know, interest rates are going up. Uh, you know, we're in a time of low prices. How do you overcome them obstacles? You know, something's going to go wrong, whether it's in the beginning, you have a cost overrun, you know, something doesn't work with the building project or two years down the road, you know, you're dealing with, uh, I, I guess one of the memories I have of a hog expansion was a customer uh, before I came to First Bank of Trust, I was in Mass in the last 20 years with Wells Fargo and working with a customer there when he was digging the, hog, the hole for his hog building, hogs were 60 cents. When he started selling them in, uh, in the Christmas of 1998, I think a lot of you in the room probably remember what hog prices were then. They were about 10 cents. So, do you have the working capital? Do you have the, you know, I plan to deal with adversities that are going to come up over, the, over time. Because long term, obviously, you know, there's, there's uh, economic benefit, hopefully to you personally, but also to the community. So if I'm uh, new and this is the first uh, operation, I'm looking in, I'm done with my schooling, I'm going, how do I know if I'm getting the right advice? How, how do I know if the partners I'm talking to are, are helping me work through all of these different things? Well, there's, obviously there's a lot of resources out there. You know, and I think your lender obviously is a very important one. You know, I think uh, you know, they can draw on a lot of experiences that we, we've worked with and where we've seen people be successful. And you know, I think the other thing to do too is to, uh, I had one of my mentors a long time ago, um, and Terry and I actually used to work together at one time many, many years ago, back in the 80s. I tell everybody that uh, um, for me, I graduated from SDSU here in 1985 and started into ag lending in the middle of farm crisis and wondered what the heck I was doing. But I, you know, one thing that I was taught by one of our mentors that I worked with at Farm Credit was to go find successful people. Successful people tend to hang out with other successful people. So go find that person that's been successful with a project like yours and ask them, get the advice from them, find out what's, uh, what's worked well, what their obstacles were, and that will help, hopefully help you be more successful. Very good advice. So on, on, on the far end of the table from me down there uh, is Nate Franzine. Nate is the president of the Agribusiness Division for First Dakota National Bank. Uh, Nate grew up on a diversified uh, family dairy, grain, and beef cattle operation, family operation uh, near Langford, and he also had the distinct pleasure of schooling uh, me and my uh, high school classmates in uh, sports as we grew up in the neighboring communities. Um, he joined uh, First, National Dakota, or First Dakota National Bank in October of 1998 and is currently the president of the Agribusiness Division, overseeing all aspects of ag banking for the company. In this capacity, he is also a member of their executive management team. For, for the bank. Another thing that I know that uh, those of us that have been in, in the egg industry uh, for a while that know Nate uh, for is 
Um, is a personal passion for, for helping young leaders and helping develop young leaders. And not that and there aren't a lot of people that are, but that's uh, one thing I think that you're personally known for, Nate. So when you think of that, what skills do you think that, uh, do you feel that young livestock producers need to succeed? That's a great, <clears throat> that's a great question. And uh, we could go a lot of directions with that. But it's come up uh, throughout the day, I know, over and over and over, and that's, that's communication skills. Um, you know, we talked about selling the project, uh, that really boils down to communication skills. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I would share, I just came back from a National Ag Bankers Conference and one of the speakers there talked about trust. And it's really resonated with me as I think about that. You know, if you want to get a livestock project done, depending on the type of project it is, Think of the people that you have to, to build trust with and earn the trust of. You know, it's not just talking to your neighbors, it's, it's building trust. They need to trust that you're gonna be a good neighbor. You're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. Uh, if you're gonna get the loan and the financing from a lender, you have to build trust with that lender. That lender has to trust that that business plan you're bringing to them uh, you understand and you're gonna follow through. You're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. And, we all know trust is built slowly over time, and all it takes is one, uh, one negative uh, experience, one bad situation where you don't follow through on your word, and you can break down trust. So I, I really think that's something uh, for us all to think about, and that, that trust is a two-way street, right? Certainly, uh, when we as a lender tell you we're going to do something, uh, we need to follow through as well, and, and we certainly understand that. Uh, in our industry. So, I, you know, I, I look at that as a real critical piece to these situations. There's going to be opposition. That's been talked about. And we may have to agree to disagree on some of those things, but do we do it in a professional manner with integrity and, and with the, uh, the leadership uh, type skills that you want to present yourself and your operation with? Thanks, Nate. Well, the next question I think all three of you could probably spend well more than an hour on, but uh, uh, Terry, I'll give you a, a crack at this one here too. Uh, so when you think of over, over the time that you've spent with a lot of uh, operations, a lot of producers, a lot of livestock operations, what do successful livestock produ production facility operations, what do they have in common? How much time do we have? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's a great question. I think we all probably are going to go down a similar path here. Um, I, it's interesting because we, I think about that all the time. Last night I was sitting there and I started writing on a tablet and I, I ended up with a couple of pages and I'm going, slow down, you know, it's different for everybody. But I think successful operations, what I see in common, can go a, a couple of different ways in there, but they have a plan. They obviously sit down, they know where they're going. Um, they are very well thought out. Um, you know, that's what's in that plan. There's a lot of things that you need to address, and some people talk about the old SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats to your operation as you go forward. What's in there and why? But break that down and, and make sure you ask plenty of questions around those. Um, you know, I think of great records. Uh, we're in the world of data, metrics, and data mining. And boy, can they tell you a lot. Um, how do I compare, or do I know how I compare to my fellow producers in this same category of a similar size, scope, and scale. What are my margins? What are my equities? What are my feed costs? What are my machinery costs? You go on down that list, it can be very long and very lengthy, but the ability to benchmark that data is so powerful, and you turn right around and ask yourself the question, what did I learn? Why am I high here? Why am I low here? Boy, it just comes, jumps right out at you. Um, Successful operations have adequate amounts of labor. They get very efficient, but make sure you don't undersell that and go to a point where it becomes a burden. Do it right, do it proper, but balance that with, with efficiency. Um, I was thinking about this and I think about successful operators, successful producers, they own it. They figure out their ways. They don't uh, dwell very long in, in, if Terry dwells very long in the, oh, why me, I can't, it's someone else's fault. They always look for the way forward much faster, and we all get in our negative zone, but get out of it and look for your way to be better. Your toggle switch needs to stay on the top side, not the bottom, and, and that makes a big, big difference. They're continual learners. 
Uh, they ask a lot of questions. They seek a lot of input from about every area you can think of. Uh, and they're pretty good leaders of their people, their families, and what have you. So I'll, I probably said more than I should, but, but those are things that just jump out at me. And, and, and through time, you see that, and it really resonates well. Well, as you can tell, uh, there's a, a reason. Oh, go ahead. Do you want to? Yeah, I think, I think we could probably just have a, have a gist on this topic about, you know, how you be successful. But, I th you know, I think it's a simple, if, if you want to make it simple, I think it's, it's literally just all about management. And I think, you know, a lot of times that sorts it out. And a lot of times, a lot, one of our jobs, a lot of times is sit and ask, you know, what, what is the strength of the management of the operation? And a lot of times that separates successful operations from not. You know, I, uh, one thing I think about management a lot of times, and I think, Terry, you brought it up, is, you know, proactive versus reactive. One of the things that, that, uh, um, that I a lot of times look for and worked in this business now for over 30 years, but when we do that annual balance sheet with our customer, I guess the one question I don't want to have them ask me is, well, how'd we do last year? I hope they know when they walk in the door to do that balance sheet how they did. You know, it, it gets to the bottom line, the net worth, did it grow from last year? If they ask you the question, well, how'd I do last year? I think that's probably not, a, probably a, you know, that's probably reactive versus proactive. Um, when I wrote my notes down here, I put in bold, bold capital letters for me. They know their cost of production. They know where their profit were. If they have an opportunity to lock in a profit and they go ahead and do it. You know, I think one of the things too that, you know, do they have a strategy? Um, I see people anguish over $100 decisions and then the, the important decisions, they make mistakes on them. You know, so the $10,000 decision, you got to get them right. As you know, margins in agriculture are really tight. You got to make sure you get them $10,000 decisions right. You can maybe make a few mistakes on the $100 ones, but the $10,000 ones, $100,000 ones, them are the ones that start giving you trouble. Um, cash flow projections. I know, I think you guys would agree. Customers and probably people out now, you don't like doing them, do you? We, we find value in them. One of the things right now that's, that, that hap this happening more is shocking them. You know, we were in really good times where, okay, if revenue dropped off 5%, expenses w went up 5%, Maybe we didn't have a problem, but right now it's a challenge. The other thing, we haven't had to deal with interest rates here for quite a while, but a lot of times shocking uh, cash flow projections right now, if you shock at five, you know, drop the income 5%, increase the ex ex expenses 5%, and then add a couple of points to the interest, you probably got cash flow projections that don't work. Then, that's still your thunder, but I heard your ad the other day, the... <laughs> Working capital, and you'll probably talk about that, but that's where another thing successful operations have, working capital. And there again, I'm stealing your commercial there. Admit I listened to it on WNX. So anyway, but you know, so there again, the, the other thing I think that was brought up earlier too is management team. And some of it will be internal, some external. Your lender, your veterinarian, your nutritionist, you know, don't try to go at it alone, especially right now when times are tough. You know, seek out advice from people to help get through these tough times. Because if you can survive these tough times, good times are ahead. So uh, just to piggyback on uh, their comments, uh, I want you know, the cash flow projection that Ed just talked about, I want to take that to another level. I, I, uh, I can tell you, and I'm sure these two would agree, that the operators we have that, that put project projections together and then at least on a monthly basis, compare their actual results to their projections uh, are some of our best performing clients. And there's a reason for that. If you think about it, uh, you need to be able to make adjustments fluidly throughout the operating year, right? Things change. We all know that. So you may set a goal today, and in 30 days, you've got to adjust that goal because something happened and it's no longer uh, a realistic goal. 60 cent hogs to 9 cent hogs you better be changing your plan, right? You better be making adjustments and you better start those adjustments as soon as you can, not at year end when you're putting your annual financials together. And so that, that's just such a critical one. And then I want to piggyback on the SWAT comment too. Uh, we talk about SWAT a lot. You learn about it in college. I think, you know, sometimes we can get lost in strategic planning and go, yeah, yeah, great. Sounds warm and fuzzy, but, but it really does work. And, and I, 
You know, I'm, I'm, I got a little Norwegian and Swede in me, so I got to keep it simple. And if I think about it, I, I think about it just this simply. What are your strengths and how do you leverage those strengths to be more successful? Okay. If you, if you focus in on that, I can promise you, you're going to be doing things that are going to help you be successful. And then you better be aware of those weaknesses, right? What are you weak at? And sometimes our ego gets in the way there, doesn't it? Well, I don't have any weaknesses. I'm pretty good at what I do. The producers that really recognize those weak weaknesses honestly look in the mirror and say, boy, I'm just, I'm not, you know, maybe it's the record keeping. I'm just not very good at the record keeping. Well, then you better align yourself with somebody to help you with that. You better find expertise to help you get that right because, uh, you know, as we go forward in ag, ag is becoming more and more complex all the time. Technological advancements, um, you know, there's just so many things and I, I admire ag producers uh, greatly and I tell people this all the time because uh, it's a very complex industry. There's a lot of moving parts, there's volatility. You can't be good at it all and, and you shouldn't expect to be good at it all, but don't pretend you're good at it all. Realize where you're weak get help where you're weak so that you have it covered, and, and the folks that do that and do that well tend to be successful. Mike, I want to follow up, but just kind of put a little humor into it. With uh, I was meeting with a new customer starting at the bank this spring, and, and uh, walked in and said, well, I fired my marketing guy. And I couldn't see any kind of comment in the file uh, who his marketing guy was. He said, well, it was me. <laughs> said, finally admitted I got to hire, I got to hire a marketing guy because he said that's one of my weaknesses and I just can't take the emotion on marketing. So, so I finally found my marketing guy and I hired somebody to help me be more successful with that. Was that me you were talking to? Because I've hired, I, I fired myself from that job too in my farm. But I have one other thing sure. to add too. You know, we talk so much about what has happened in ag and we talk about what happened to land values and stuff. And we were at a conference recently also and we were visiting about, we think about what helps producers and what are maybe some of the more successful ones, what do they do? They, they stay in their capacity world. They stay in their income and expense world and they understand what that is and how it matches up and what it meets. If you go over here and you rely on your equity world too long, you're going to use it and you're going to use it in some fashion. So make sure you do the best you can. Let the working capital and that perhaps be a shock absorber at some point in cycles, but do your best to stay in your income and expense world, your capacity world. Well, as you can tell, uh, these three gentlemen are, are a lot more interested in a lot more about than just making loans and collecting interest. They, their, their roles and how they see interact with producers is a lot more than that and deeper than that. And uh, Ed, you've been very active in your communities over time and, and looking at things from a community perspective, not, not, per, not just an individual operation perspective, as, as the other two guys there as well. But uh, you know, if there's some young producers that are looking, you know, how do I get in where I just can't just walk in through the door into an operation or drive down the driveway? What are you seeing out there for entry level type opportunities and ancillary opportunities, especially, you know, we've talked, uh, discussed it with uh, livestock where there's all these ancillary opportunities. So, so how does a young producer get into that? Maybe they don't have interest in directly production ag, but they want to be a part of, of, of agriculture. What do you see for some other opportunities out there? I've heard some of them brought up this morning, and I've you know, witnessed some of them where, um, yeah, it's, it's very tough to get started. I think uh, those for us, I think if you go back to the generation, you know, like our fathers and so forth, if you wanted to get started, you walked into the Farmer's Home Administration office and got a ten twenty thousand dollars $20,000 loan, and away you went. You know, and they gave you 100% financing and hope it worked. But uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot different, you know, than it used to be as far as getting started. Um, you know, one good comment that I thought had really good value this morning was, uh, and, I, and I've witnessed this even in a couple of customers I now work with in Brookings here, where you could say they were, uh, um, the, the family needs a transition plan and nobody in their immediate family is looking to continue on the family farm so it's just like they adopted got an adopted son that's going to you know become part of the operation and you know and, and you're not in the, the the one thing to keep in mind there you're not going to start in the corner office you're probably going to be the one uh, doing the crappy jobs and so forth that that the you could say your adopted father doesn't want to do anymore and you're probably uh, you're not as the saying went when back when we were growing up you were you were on the hay rack you weren't driving the baler so you get to throw the bales for a while and do that crappy work, but there's probably a reward for it. You know, in a lot of cases too, um, you know, with the, you probably, you maybe need, 
you're maybe going to have to burn the candle on, the, on both ends a little bit. It's maybe not be fun, but I've seen some of the guys that get ahead, either them or their, or their wife, they, they're in town, they have the insurance, they have the, the uh, you know, the off-farm income to drive that to help them so that they're not also trying to pull family living out of that small operation so they're able to get ahead quicker. So, you know, it's probably not a simple answer that we give you how you get started, and there's a lot of variations to that. But I think, you know, somebody also commented this morning about being open-minded about it and being willing to, you know, look at all options because they are out there. Quick story, we have a beginning farmer program at our bank, and when we first started that, we'd bring young producers in and we'd talk to them about how to go have the conversation with their parents or grandparents or whoever about, you know, how do I, how do I work in and how do I someday own the farm? And uh, that was uh, a great conversation to have with those young people, but we made a mistake. We didn't have their parents and their grandparents in the room at the same time, and so they went home all energized, wanting to talk about how do I get ownership of the farm, and uh, the parents were stepping back saying, whoa, 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 I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm young, I'm not retired, what are we talking about this for? And so, you know, the advice I give young folks all the time is be, be very respectful in how you approach that. Um, you know, Ed's right, you don't start at the top, and, and if you think about it, you don't start at the top no matter what you do, right? If you come to work for a bank, if you go to work for a, an ag business, you're not going to start at the top. That's normal. You have to work your way and earn your way. Uh, back to that trust comment I made earlier, right? You have to build that trust and that expertise. The other thing I always uh, um, tell young folks is don't ever approach the conversation as though you're, you're, you deserve an inheritance or you, you deserve something in that farm. Always approach the conversation, what value am I bringing to the operation? How am I going to make this operation better? And if you approach it with that mindset, the, in, the inheritance piece will work its way out over time in most cases, especially if you develop a good trusting relationship with all parties and you communicate along the way, uh, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. The ones that don't tend to come into it with the wrong mentality and tend to not have very good communication skills. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's such a capital intense industry, we know that, and the margins are so small. Sometimes I'll use the comment, high risk ag has to look internally sometimes, and that means perhaps my father, uncle, brother, cousin, whoever that might be, to be open to helping, because that's the, the nature of it. If I have no equity going in, I can't expect Ed or Nate to make me a loan. I've gotta have another plan, or I've gotta have off farm I have to have something else. So. Think, think that way also. There's other ways and sources in which maybe you can skin that cat. But I, I look at just a comment on it. One other comment, and, and this is a tremendous opportunity for, for the next generation of ag. I mentioned earlier how technologically advanced we're becoming. Um, you know, that's challenging for some of our older generation folks in some cases. That can be the value you bring to that operation. I'm going to help us get more advanced, more technological in this area, and that's going to have efficiencies that make our farm and ranch better. I see that all the time. You know, I see operations where, um, you know, the young individual uh, that just got out of college is, is helping them ramp up to a new technology that's going to make that farm much better, more efficient, and more viable for the long term. So don't, don't misread us here. There's opportunity to do things there. There, there really is. Um, but, but you gotta, you gotta work that out and, and don't be afraid to work for someone else for a while. You know, there's other, there's great jobs out in the industry too. And, and that might be the experience you need that gives you the ability to come back down the road. Yeah. I just, that just really sparked the thought in my mind. Nate. we had a young customer, you, I worked with the family, third generation. They came back and this is years ago. He thought strip tilling would be really quite the thing to do. So we set him up and the technology piece of that puzzle, he's turned out to be really successful with that but he went off, created a venture, and it, it's worked out well for him. So there's, there's ways. One of the things to be careful of, I guess I feel like I observed through the years is, uh, you know, if you do come back to the operation, and I think all three of us agree up here, normally it's not gonna be successful to take the existing operation and, and, and just divide it in two or break you off a third. Normally you gotta figure out a way if somebody's coming back to, okay, how are we gonna grow revenue to justify you know, me being add to the operation. And there again, it's probably look for ways that you can generate, generate additional revenue without taking on a bunch of additional risk with that or putting the existing operation at risk as you uh, bring another partner and grow revenue of the operation. 
Well, that's a great lead into my next question, Ed, and I'll, I'll make uh, Nate uh, start out uh, with this. Is, uh, just what are some of the economic multipliers that you guys are seeing uh, when, uh, when livestock development or further livestock expansion is part of the, part of the process, part of the, the operation, not just in the operation, but uh, as, it, as it goes out in, into, the, into the whole community? If you have a, not just operations specific, but in the communities and stuff, what are those economic multipliers that you guys are recognizing that are out there that are helping individuals and, and communities be more successful. Yeah, so, so if you look at a lot of the modern uh, livestock production activities going on, whether it's, you know, we all know that dairy processing has expanded in our part of the state. So that means we need more dairy cows to fill that processing void. Well, are you gonna be able to start a dairy at the size and scale that you need to to be competitive? Maybe, but maybe not. But if not, think about what goes on around that dairy, uh, from silage chopping to, to additional labor to uh, the opportunity to take um, their, their nutrients uh, uh, to put on your fields potentially. There's just all kinds of partnerships. That's a dairy example. You know, the same applies with swine. The same applies with, with a cattle feed yard. Um, you can look around uh, areas that have some of that going on and you'll notice more vibrant rural communities. There's more activity, there's more need for the feed store, there's more need for veterinarian services, uh, genetic services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, these livestock development opportunities are a very good economic uh, development opportunity for that region and that area in that state. And so, uh, so, so they're, they're real and uh, they're certainly out there. Yeah, the impact on the communities, I think about some of the areas I serve are very, very rural, and those towns are really, really struggling. And we gotta have animal agriculture in those areas, or they're just, they're gonna continue to struggle even worse. And the, the spinoff, as Nate alluded to, with labor and personnel and children and grocery stores, rather than closing, things of that nature, that all makes a large impact because without it it's going to be difficult for some of those real rural communities some of the schools I, I think about you go down the list and there's like five of them are co-oping anymore just to get a, a, a basketball or a football team together so it's, it, we got to try to stem that tide you know, maybe a 30,000 foot view on this too think about what's going on right now with global trade right and think about some of the glut of soybeans we have in our northern parts of our territory um, what if we had more demand for those soybeans right, right here in our, own, in our own neighborhoods, whether it's meal for swine or crush plant or whatever it might be, it's a way for us to diversify our own economy too so we're not quite so dependent on some of these other markets where we ship it out and, and are dependent on those, those other markets. We create our own and it uh, gives us some, some real diversity. So uh, kind of to follow up with that, uh, you know, some of these ancillary businesses, uh, other opportunities that are out there. So when, uh, when an individual comes in to, uh, to visit with you and it, it's not a, a traditional uh, uh, agricultural operation, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ancillary business that's, uh, hey, I want to go into the manure injection business or I want to do, do, use the technology and the knowledge, you know, that you guys talked about and either farm or school or other career and I want to go off and do something. It's it's related, but it's more of a connecting business uh, with uh, directly production A. How do you guys, as, as lenders and as institutions, do you approach those differently than you would a traditional uh, production A uh, uh, type scenario? Or what are, what are things that are the same or different? Or, and, and what advice would you give to somebody to be prepared to come in and have that conversation with you? Well, for one thing, some of the fundamentals would absolutely be the same. You know, it's about the business plan for it. There again, they also ask yourself the management factor of it, you know. Have you, have you done your homework? You know, if you're talking manure, manure injection business, have you talked to your potential customers on that? Um, you know, to gauge your market? Because obviously the most important thing is whatever product it is that you're gonna get into, what's your market for it? What's the barriers to success? You know, and, and you know, realistically, do you have a realistic plan? And you know, what obstacles are you gonna incur? And you know, what's gonna help you make you successful? Yeah, I think about those, and, and I've had a, a number of those through the years, and that plan that Ed was alluding to, very, very important, but they come in, and those that were highly successful, this is what I've done, here's what I already have in my back pocket, 
here's how I'm going to start this. I'm not going to start it with the $300,000 tractor and the $200,000 injector or whatever. Here's how I'm going to do whatever the plan is. But they had a, such a set plan, had an entire customer base in addition to what they did, that just propelled them. The next person that wants to try a venture, well, I'm going to figure it out as I go. Eh, it's not going to work. You know, it's just, but just do that planning part of that puzzle and you're way, way ahead. You know, one thing that it's maybe a little bit of a shift in, in gears, but I think when we're talking about livestock development, we need to talk about third-party risk. And uh, we're, we're kind of touching on it here. It kind of ties into, hey, do you have, a, do you have a, a market for your product? But, you know, it also ties in when we talk about some of these livestock operations where there's vertical integration. You're dependent on getting your animals from another source, or you're dependent on other entities to make your operation work, that, that's very normal anymore in agriculture. But I think it's really important as you look at your, your operation, who are you aligning with and have you done your homework about them? Have you done your due diligence? Do you know they're a strong partner? Do you know their track record? Um, we as lenders spend a lot of time trying to help you with that uh, because we also want to know if, if, you're, if your repayment of the loan is dependent on a contract you have with another entity, we want to understand the strength of that contract. Who's behind that and will they make the payments on the contract like they say they will? So um, uh, I think that's a really important piece of livestock development too as you, as you look forward and, and it's only uh, becoming more and more important as uh, we look at livestock operations going forward. Yeah, I guess to follow up on Nate's comment, there again, it's almost like a chain. And then our job is to figure out uh, what's the weakest link in the chain and what's the likelihood of that, that that chain's gonna break and you know, cause a problem because one of our primary jobs is to uh, you know, manage the risk to our organization and hopefully to minimize that. You know, but you know, here locally, um, when you talk about you know, your risk, um, here locally, we unfortunately had an elevator that went under and that had severe, you know, economic impact to a lot of people and some families that, you know, turned out to be seven figures were the losses and, you know, them type of things. Not many of them can occur to, to survive, you know, in these tough times. Well, if any of you have questions uh, for these three gentlemen, I, I could uh, keep them entertained all day. I'm uh, still got a bunch of questions that I can think of uh, to ask them, but you can tell uh, you have a great vast uh, wealth of knowledge in front of you. If anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to come up and grab a microphone or um, uh, go ahead. So at any time, I just want to, um, a thought that I have is that maybe some folks are, are maybe thinking of is, so we're talking about opportunities that we also see the, the short-term challenges in the, in the industry. Uh, Nate, you mentioned uh, international and world uh, markets and the economies that fit. So when you, when you look at all, all those things, kind of more from a big picture standpoint, what really is the, the future and, and what, what do you see as the outlook or the appetite for, for a livestock uh, and agriculture production right now? Um, you know, kind of the short term and the long term. You know, if, if I was coming to you, I'd say, boy, should, what do you think? Should I get into this or not kind of thing? What's yeah. your perspective? You know, if I look long term, I, I'm still real bullish on agriculture and I'll, I'll, sh I'll share why. If you think about what's happened globally, what's happening around us, um, most of the population in the world is not in our country, is it? Uh, it's happening in other parts of the, of the world. And that large number of population is growing in their economic status. That is a really good thing for U.S. agriculture, right? As China's economy continues to grow and more and more Chinese are in the middle class, and I'm just using China as an example, there's others, right? That's more people that want to eat better. That's more people that want to change their diet from grains and other things to protein, to what we're here talking about today, livestock. And so I remain very bullish long-term uh, for our industries. Uh, certainly today we have some bumps, right? The commodity uh, levels are tight. Trading is uh, a little bumpy right now with negotiations. Uh, you know, we don't know how that's going to turn out. Uh, hopefully the administration... Uh, knows what they're doing and we're going to get a good trade deal that is better for all of us long term. That's what we're all hoping for. And, uh, you know, maybe they can get that done tomorrow. That'd be great, right? Uh, but we know that's probably not likely. It's going to take some time. Uh, in the meantime, we got some bumps to work through and we all recognize that. But I remain very bullish for agriculture. I think 
the U.S. is positioned very well. Um, we have the best technology. We have the best university system and land grants sitting here today at SDSU to help us maintain that technological edge. And uh, we've got bright people learning how to do it better and better every day. And I think that's going to keep us out in front. Um, that doesn't mean we won't have some challenges along the way. Uh, ditto. Our, our focus is also very bullish uh, protein sector, egg sector. Demand has remained quite strong. Uh, there can be demand uh, disruptors out there, but the, the demand has remained very, very good. But that technology piece and being a low-cost producer and understanding your records and what they're telling you, telling you, it's amazing the differences in operations and amazing the difference in production and efficiencies and capacity and feed. Get sharp on those because you will, you'll continue to win if, if you're sharp on those and you make your adjustments. But yeah, there's those, no question. Um, South Dakota's poised so well right now. We see an expansion and explosion in the hog sector with the finishing barns and, and, and uh, other areas are coming here for those reasons. So we're, we're very bullish. Yeah, I think all three of us, uh, you know, work for organizations that are heavily invested in agriculture and will continue to be. And, and I think, you know, our appetite for livestock I think we'll, I think kind of would go hand in hand with the management capability, the person that brings the project to us, you know, because uh, that's probably the most important thing. A lot of times it's the most difficult to measure. But, you know, I, yeah, we definitely remain bullish on it. And I, you know, if, I think the thing to look at too is, you know, how can I survive these tough times? What changes can I make? You know, honestly, one that we look at quite often is that I think a lot of times is maybe not looked at close enough or maybe there can be opportunities with that is family living expense and what what things can i do to to be as efficient as i can I, I, one thing i would say though you know make sure you're cutting fat not muscle in your operation you know because there's uh sometimes you'll see that you know if you you start cutting things out of your crop inputs and so forth then it's kind of going to cut your yield back maybe that don't make sense but you know know your costs you know know your break evens if you have an opportunity to you know a small profit right now you know, keeps you in business and keeps you around for the better times that are ahead. One more comment, Mike, that I would make about tough times. You know, if you think about it, this doesn't apply just to agriculture, right? I can, I can think of times in, in our bank where we went through some tough times and we almost always came out of it much, much better, right? You usually get better in the tough times. You figure out how to, how to really make your operation better uh, when you go through some challenges. So, um, I know it's not always fun, and I know it's easy to get down in the environment we're in, but view it as an opportunity. What can I do to get myself sharper, to get myself better, so that when this thing turns around, I'm even positioned more competitively and, and better in the industry to be successful? Well, I think you were reading my mind, Nate, because that's the, the kind of the direction I was going to go next is, you know, we know in ag production, we're always kind of on somewhat of a roller coaster. And, you know, we have had great times, we have challenging times, but our challenges come opportunities, like you say. Um, through your careers, through your lifetimes, you know, we always uh, relate back to the 80s. Uh, you had mentioned that early on, Ed, as well, too. And what are some of the, uh, maybe the lessons that we as an in industry, uh, whether from the egg lending industry or from the egg production in South Dakota, that we have learned through some of those challenging times? How that made us stronger and how can we avoid similar pitfalls in, in the future with the next generation? Well, I think we'd all, all three of us up here would say, you know, we learned from our people that were our mentors, and I think even some of it directly with, you know, 38 years, and I mean, I'm at 33, I think it is, got to do my math, but it's getting to be a while. Anyway, is that, you know, the lenders have changed. I think, you know, production ag has changed. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, I saw it in files where, I think us as lenders back in the 80s, 70s, and 80s, and you know, we lived off inflation, we were collateral lenders, you know, now, you know, that's probably one of the least important things we look at. Now it's all about cash flow. It's all about management. You know, so we've definitely changed. We look at cash flow. That's why we want you to do them projections. And, and you know, Nate had a great comment about, you know, getting back to them because them cash flow projections that you bring in and we go over probably end up being, they're probably wrong two days down the road. So that's why you want to revisit them and make adjustments and whatever you need to do to, to uh, you know, continue to have them be a tool for us and a tool for both of us. We work together, but, and most importantly is communication. You know, I would say, you know, I got into the, to the business in 1985 when I graduated from SDSU here. And the, and the thing that was definitely not going on was communication. And I think you guys would agree with that. So, 
you know, definitely maintain that level of communication. And it's not just with your lender. A lot of times I saw in the 80s, which was very unfortunate, was lack of communication with spouse. In a lot of cases, the farm wife had no idea that there was even a problem because the farm wife probably could have helped that situation, you know, with maybe managing their expenses in the house. Maybe could have maybe could have went and got a job to help their situation. So, you know, communication, communication, communication. You know, as I always say, whether it's your wife, your kids, your whoever, if you have a problem, it's usually due to communication gap. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, many are very, very good at product, the production side. I challenge each one of you out there to raise your financial acumen around what, what that means, what are your stressors, what are your pressure points, and, and understand that. Talk to your lender if you don't understand what that means. What are those ratios? What are they telling you? Those standards are set in place for a reason. They're very, very good. They guide you very, very well from a lender's perspective. I'm sure we all have standards we live by. But they're telling you something, and pay attention to what they're telling you. And if you raise that financial acumen on those things, whether it be a working capital, cash flow, owner equity, however you do that, raise the bar and understand what they're telling you. And if you don't, ask, and, and you'll get the answers. I want to piggyback on Ed's communication thing, and it ties into my trust comment earlier. A tip for all of you if you want to build your relationship with your lender communicate bad news just as fast as you communicate good news. And I mean that very sincerely. You know, uh, we, we gain trust in you as one of our clients if you are, are just as quick to come to us when you have a problem as you are when you want to come and share how good something turned out. Um, if you come to us right away with that challenge or that problem you're dealing with, we're in the best position to work together to resolve it. But if we find out about it uh, down the road after a lot of time has passed, sometimes it's too late, right? And, 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 then, and then we maybe break down in trust because we say, wow, that's, that happened a long time ago. Why, do, why am I learning about this now, right? So that communication can be so critical. Uh, I'm using the lender client as an example, but that applies in your, within your operation too, right? Uh, if you're in charge of a portion of your operation and something goes wrong, keep your other partners informed. Talk about it on a regular basis. And and uh, you're going to resolve problems much better if you're proactive about them. Yeah, that's a great point. Our mission is to help. That's what it's about. Our mission is to try to help you be successful. So open up those lines if they're not there. Let us try to help. And, and we'll, together we can work it, work it through. So you gentlemen talked a lot about uh, the different things and what you look for in a, in a client and in, in, in a customer and, you know, what things are important that they need to have and, it, you know, the knowledge they need to have, the, the, the understandings they need to have coming to you. Um, if, if you get somebody that comes in your door and wants to invest in or expand an operation and everything is there but the equity piece, you know, they, you have, they have the right mindset, they have the, the skill set apparent to, uh, to be a great manager, they have the the, you know, the business connections, they have markets and things. Uh, what are some creative ways that you guys have, have looked at to, to assist uh, uh, folks in, in that precarious uh, situation where it just plain comes down to equity to help get them over the hump and get them rolling and get them going so that it's, it's a good project for everyone? Yeah, that can take, take quite a few different angles there. I think, I think about what, what's most important. Um, a couple of conversations recently where they, they, it was very, very important because they lost some land, uh, very, very important to develop their livestock. But they said, we well, know I don't have the ability to do that. So then can you partner with somebody? Can you, we, we start going down a path, all these p p things they can do. And, and this particular uh, farmer decided that he was going to end up selling some land to look internally because he felt that he could be more productive and, and provide more value through the protein side. So he was, he was willing to give something up in order to gain something down the road. And that's hard to do, but ass assess what those are. Um, you know, don't rule out uh, sources, uh, other family members perhaps, but be very, very open and honest up front. Maybe some people have to give a percentage of their operation to grow and if they're right to buy it back. There's different ways to do things as you think about that. But uh, limited capital causes some very unique challenges, there's no question. One thing I've found through the years is, uh, you know, the young operator that comes in that doesn't have the equity, you know, if you talk about it as part of the, you know, the transition plan, a lot of times the parents are willing to step in, you know, and help with that, you know, to help, uh, 
you know, if we have a good idea, it's just got the, you know, the one link, weak link to it. Maybe they're willing to, uh, you know, provide a guarantee or provide collateral, whatever it would be, to, to uh, maybe shore up the banks, uh, address the banks' uh, concerns about risk or, or maybe the lack of equity and so forth, and to move that project forward. A couple things I'd add to the, the topic when we're talking about undercapitalized uh, operations or situations. You know, I think we all try to leverage every program available out there to help somebody through that. And so I'd, I'll bring up FSA guarantees. I know sometimes we bring that word up to a customer and they, they kind of scowl. Oh, I, I don't want to have to deal with FSA. I'm telling you, it's a very effective tool to bridge the gap, uh, to help us work, stick with you to bridge the gap. Uh, when we might be in a tight situation or an undercapitalized situation. Terry Labrie sitting out here in the audience, the Aggie bond program we have at the state level can play a role at times as well. Uh, nutrient management bonds are available for some of these types of livestock projects we're talking about, and that can, that can give you a better interest rate uh, situation. So there's, there's things we can do, there's tools we can pull from to, to help you with. And then the last thing I would just say about being undercapitalized, um, as I look at agriculture 10, 15, 20 years down the road, this, this problem of capitalization only gets greater, right? Technology is advancing so that we can do more with, uh, with less, right? So our equipment is going to be able to handle more acres if we, uh, just from a technological standpoint, but can we afford more acres? In many cases, we're not going to be able to afford more acres. What's that mean? Well, that means, uh, you know, kind of goes full circle back to this communication thing. We're going to need to figure out how to partner with people. There's people with capital out there that would love to invest it, uh, but they don't have the expertise you do as an operator to convert that investment into a return. So can a partnership form? And, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the financial acumen comment, the challenge to up your financial acumen. If you're going to work, look at partnerships and, and partnering and using other people's capital to help you do that, you need to, you need to up your financial acumen with that as well. So I, I think that's going to be a more and more common thing as we look down the road in, in agriculture as it continues to develop. And, and uh, that's not necessarily negative. That, that's an opportunity for those that embrace it. Well, you mentioned a good point, uh, Nate, in uh, uh, row cropping, and we've seen it a lot in some livestock, you know, you know, dairy in particular, is, as if I could pick one out as an example, where the economies of scale have gotten so much larger. So, uh, so how, how, does a, how does a producer go about making those partnerships and building those partnerships? What circles do they need to involve themselves and engage themselves in to, to find some of those opportunities there. What, what things have you guys uh, seen or observed or advice would you give someone in that regard? I think the one thing would be is, you know, determining your market. You know, if you're sitting next to a dairy and see that, you know, that they, uh, maybe they have lack facilities, maybe they need somebody to take care of their, their heifers for them or their dry cows, or they need somebody to chop silage for them or something along them lines or haul manure or do whatever. You know, I think a lot of it, whether it's uh, agriculture or, you know, business in general, determine that need and the opportunity from it and develop a business plan. And, and then back to my salesman comment before, it's selling the idea that it's something that's worthwhile for the bank to invest in for you to be successful. You know, I've seen capital come from a lot of different places. Um, you know, we're a state that right now, this time of year, have all kinds of people from all around the country coming to pheasant hunt, Right. We see a lot of our farm producers out there uh, develop a relationship with a, a pheasant hunter that's been to their farm or ranch many times uh, to hunt that, that happens to be a, a successful businessman in another field or a, a doctor, a surgeon, or whatever the case may be, and they say, you know, I, I wouldn't mind investing in some land. Well, that's an opportunity potentially for that farm to, to bring that partner in as an investor and farm the land, rent the land from them on fair terms, and expand that base to make you to help bring you to size and scale. So that's an example. Um, you know, the other extreme, we're seeing some investment funds uh, actually surface in the state here and there. Uh, I know a lot of people would view that as very negative. Um, it, it depends on the fund, in my opinion. Uh, there are funds out there that have a 50-year view on their investment in ag, and they're they're going to be a strong, stable partner for some people. 
Um, now you have to be careful of the fund that's in it for the quick buck, right? Because they'll be in it today and gone tomorrow. That's not the partners we're looking for. But I think you're going to find partners from a lot of different areas, uh, neighbors, family members, uh, and, and everything else. So uh, I think uh, ag needs to continue to have an open mind about that. So we've had uh, a lot of discussions in a lot of areas uh, this entire day, and uh, as you uh, participated and uh, been in the audience and participating that way as well too, if there's a takeaway that you'd like uh, a younger producer or somebody looking at an expansion or something, if there was one takeaway, because we, we get so many things in our mind that we forget some of it, if there was one thing that you could hope that everyone would take away from, from our conversations today, what would that be? I'd say stay positive. You know, we, we understand the ups and downs. Um, you, you're in control of your attitude. Attitude determines altitude. And when you, you create that the right way and don't think of something that maybe is maybe less pleasing to you, think of it, how, how I'm gonna make, you know, lemonade out of that lemon. Stay the high road. Look for your way forward because, yeah, there's a lot of things we don't control, a lot of things you can't control. But how do you go about that and how to do it? So I think if you stay positive and you stay focused on, on your passion and your direction, wow, it, it can make a, a tremendous difference. Yeah, I would definitely agree with positive attitude. I would also, you know, tag onto that with uh, what can you bring to the table, you know, for somebody? What, what is your strengths? Where can you bring value? And then leverage that into an opportunity for you, especially when you're young to, to, you know, to create opportunities. You know, especially if you are lacking in capital or whatever, you might bring the, you know, it was talked about earlier today about, you know, don't discount the value of your education. You know, Precision Ag starting here at SDSU, the only university in the country that has Precision Ag. Can you imagine the value that that's gonna bring going forward to production ag? It's, it could be, could be priceless. And it's something that you can bring back to the operation or bring, you know, to, to a, a business that, where that can help you get uh, started with uh, your business plan and your opportunity down the road. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, uh, you know, back to the positivity, you know, follow your passion. You know, too often I see someone enter uh, the ag business because they, they feel they have to, right? It's expected of me. I, I grew up in this family, so I have to come back. Um, there's lots of opportunities in agriculture, so uh, follow your passion. And if it is to come back and be a part of that family operation, terrific. But if it isn't, that's nothing to be ashamed of. Follow your passion. And, um, you know, if you show up to work every day loving what you do, you really never go to work a day in your life. And, and if you approach things uh, that way, I think you'll be very, very successful. You know, that's a, a great perspective too, Nate, and that's the thing that I th think I look back when I graduated high school in 1988, and if you wanted to be in agriculture, you had to you have an interest in livestock or, or crop farming pretty much, and you had to be engaged in those activities, and now, and you know, if you have an interest in biology or chemistry or engineering or technology or, I mean, the list goes on and on, you have a place, right, in direct, directly in, in production agriculture. Um, because that everything has changed uh, so much and is uh, much more advanced, and so there are a lot of opportunities. And yeah, follow your follow your passion is a very good way. Anything uh, we missed there, guys? Um, any comments from the the audience or questions? I just comment. I'm a living example. Family of ten, 1980. There was no room for me. <laughs> I got a, two brothers back there now. But I wanted to stay close to it, and wow, I, I couldn't have landed in a better spot. But that's just, there's, it's out there. Keep open and keep, keep positive. But. Yeah, I would ditto that. Uh, I grew up on a farm uh, south here, south of Del Rapids, and came to school here and, you know, definitely entertained possibilities of going back to the farm. But in the middle of the farm crisis of the 80s, that was not an opportunity. My parents got audited one year there in the 80s because the IRS did not believe they had paid that much interest. So I would tell you. <laughs> I can remember going, you know, with my, my father to his uh, renewal appointment when I, in uh, January of 1984, when I was on vacation from college here, and I could tell things were a challenge. And my dad, we, we talk about the things at that time that, that's, uh, that definitely drove the farm crisis, you know, high interest rates. Um, for a lot of people in this area, the soybeans got snow in the field in the fall of 83. Some of you may remember that. And then uh, just, uh, just obviously uh, 
just a lot of challenges and and I think it was both sides of the equation not had never dealt with it before which really created a challenge too but uh, my father to this day we still talk about it every once in a while because he'll ask how the job's going and then ask to uh, you know here's in the news that maybe we're in some more uh, challenging times again but I always talk about the uh, that like I think the comment was today said that chores kept me out of bankruptcy court bankruptcy court having that dairy cow herd that made me get up every morning at 4 30 in the morning and milk 100 head of cows kept us out of bankruptcy court well with that i would like to thank uh, you gentlemen uh, terry ed and, and nate uh, appreciate your time thank you very much